Okay, hello guys. Uh, this is our first test of putting a physics lecture of notes online. Hopefully this will allow us to do more labs and work together uh, in class a little more often rather than uh, listening to me talk. So uh, today, a pretty simple topic, uh, but a very important one. We're going to learn the basics of momentum. And our objectives are, are threefold. The first thing we want to do is uh, be able to calculate momentum. And you're going to find out that's a piece of cake once we find the, uh, the equation. Two, be able to calculate a change in momentum, so just a slight extension of the first one. And then number three, really probably the most important to uh, physics students or a practicing scientist or engineer, is realizing how, how does momentum actually change? What physically uh, in nature would change something's momentum? And how can we uh, use that to describe what we see or maybe uh, predict what will happen or engineer something? So let's get going. You know, momentum is one of those words uh, there's a lot of them in physics where it's used in everyday language as well. And we use it a lot of times with uh, maybe sports sports teams. Uh, the 49ers are winning a lot. They've got a lot of momentum. What does that mean? It, it's hard to beat them. It's, it's hard to stop them. Or maybe just in this last political campaign, we heard uh, the Romney or the Obama uh, campaign had lost momentum. Uh, they start, stopped moving forward. So um, it's certainly not used in a technical sense, but it is used in more or less the same sense that a physicist would use the word momentum. Um, the answer in, in words, what we would say is, what is momentum? We'd say it's it's mass in motion, and in that, uh, to write that out as an equation is also pretty simple. Mass, of course, well, it speaks for itself. We would measure that in kilograms, and motion might be adequately described by the velocity. So that is the equation for momentum. Now, because m is already used for mass, we use, uh, I think it's Greek or Latin, uh, p. Uh, there's a Greek or Latin word that would mean going forward for the variable of momentum. So let's just clean that up. It's basically just mass times velocity. And that should make sense. You know, if you think about it as momentum as something is hard to stop, if something has a lot of momentum, then that equation should say it. Something with a lot of mass Moving fast with a high velocity would be hard to stop. It would have a lot of momentum. So a freight train or a train might be an example of that. This momentum has got, or it comes from a lot of mass and a big velocity. A tiny little butterfly would have a little momentum because it doesn't have very much mass, and typically butterflies aren't moving very fast. Uh, so those are the extremes. You can imagine something in between, maybe, you know, a bullet. Uh, fired out of a gun. It's got a little mass, but it's got a really big velocity, so it could have a substantial momentum. The point is, it's really simple. Momentum is just mass times velocity. The units, though, are a little bit cumbersome to say. Uh, the units are just the units of the variables, so kilogram meter per second, and there is no shorthand way of saying that. Remember, a force was a kilogram meter squared per second squared, and we said, ah, that's too, you get too tongue-tied saying that all the time. We called it a Newton. Well, we don't do that with momentum. There is no shorthand way. So when I say, you say the momentum is 10, and I say 10 what? You have to answer, it is 10 kilogram meters per second. That's the unit. Now, P equals MV is really too simple to spend very much time on, right? I mean, that's real simple algebra, real simple math to solve for any of those variables. What we're going to be interested in and what we're finding a trend in, in physics is, is we're really more interested in how things change. So uh, figuring out a, a, an easy way or a clean way of uh, expressing the change in momentum is going to be important. Remember in physics, in a lot of sciences, chain, uh, change rather gets the universal symbol uh, delta, Greek letter delta. So we're talking about change in momentum, delta P. I could express this a couple of different ways. These are all equivalents. So remember, delta always means final minus initial. And momentum, if you remember, what we just wrote on the last slide is MVF minus MVI. And then we could also go extract that out. The mass typically will not change in a problem for us, so we could factor that out, and I get M times VF minus VI, and then maybe most succinctly M times delta V. Those are all equivalent expressions for delta P, right? Pretty simple. So let's just work with one form of the equation here um, and take a look at these pictures to see how momentum would change. How would we use something like this? Well, 
we got two prob two pictures here, and, and they're both representing kind of the opposites. We're going to slingshot one man, so we're going to take him from low momentum to high momentum, and then we're going to do the opposite with the Ferrari. We're imagining it's racing with a lot of momentum, and then it stops. It has low momentum. We're just going to see how the, the mathematics would work out to describe that. So in the top picture, we're concerned with the mass or the momentum of the guy in the slingshot, right? So initially, he has uh, very little momentum to begin with. So here's my initial momentum vector. It uh, really should just be a dot and no vector. He's stationary. And then finally, he's going to be slingshot off. And this might be, uh, when he leaves the slingshot, his final velocity vector or his final momentum vector. So in this case, we can see uh, the final vector is a lot longer or greater than the initial vector. So we might say that this is a positive change in momentum. And again, it would be mass, uh, the final velocity, and then the initial velocity is really zero in this case. So we're left with a positive change in momentum. If we look down at the Ferrari, uh, the opposite is true. You can imagine it's racing in um, with this vector, high speed, initial momentum vector, high velocity, and then it hits the pole and it ends with this vector. So this would be our VF and this would be our VI. If we look at the mass of the Ferrari in this problem, uh, the mathematics looks like this. Well, my zero velocity for final, it stopped, minus some initial velocity. So in that case, I have a negative change in momentum. Now, it won't always be this simple, but for the most part, a positive change in momentum means something speeding up. It's getting, mo getting momentum, and a negative change in momentum means something is slowing down, and its momentum is being lowered. One of the reasons I chose these pictures is because it also gives you an indication that momentum is something that's changed over time. You could imagine the person in the slingshot, right? That it's going to take a moment. Those rubber bands are going to stretch out, and they're going to pull him for a bit, and he's going to be in contact with that sling for a bit. Likewise with the Ferrari, he didn't just stop instantly, although in real life it was pretty fast, but you can imagine the bumper just making contact with that pole and then seeing that car crumple, and over the time frame of maybe a few fractions of a second, we've changed the momentum. So that's important for our next step. Now, these pictures are similar to the previous pictures. Uh, they're time-lapse pictures, so they're really slowed down, but you get an idea of what we th see with the naked eye and we think is happening instantaneously happens actually over a period of time. So the first picture, uh, this unfortunate fellow getting hit in the face with a water balloon, uh, you see the water balloon actually deforming, so it doesn't pop instantly. It would reach his face probably round, and then it deforms, and then it pops. But the point is, uh, this action is taking place over some duration of time. It doesn't happen instantly. Something that also happens really quick to the naked eye would be you know, a batter hitting a baseball. I chose this picture because you can actually see the deformation of the baseball. So the ball is actually in contact with the bat for some amount of time. You know, you know, from our stand frame of reference, it's a really short time, but it is a short amount of time. The other thing that's happening then is a push or a pull. You can imagine uh, this water balloon is pushing the guy's face in that direction. The baseball is pushing the ball, or the baseball bat, rather, is pushing the ball in that direction. So to change something's momentum requires a push or a pull, and that's a force. And of course, in reality, that force is exerted over some time frame. So we have this new thing in physics, which we call the impulse. And it's simply the force times the change in time. And again, this F times delta T here is known as the impulse. So what's the connection? How do we go from this new equation to what we just talked about, momentum? We're going to see that there's a real, uh, a really important relationship. So let's go back to the change in momentum um, in this form. It looked like delta P is mass times a change in velocity. Right? We're going to keep that in mind. And then what I just told you is we have this new idea something called the impulse, which is force times a change in time. So if we go back to our last unit, we know we can express the force um, as a mass times the mass's acceleration. So I'll keep that in there. So these are equivalent statements. F delta T is the same thing as MA delta T. 
And from the very first unit, kinematics, we might recognize acceleration as a change in velocity over a change in time. And again, we got that change of time. Well, hey, look at that. These cancel, and I've really expressed then uh, the impulse as this. So we're seeing there's a relationship. The impulse, force times time, equals the change in momentum. So again, we would call this term the impulse, and this one, momentum. And this together is called the impulse, momentum, theorem. Really useful in physics and engineering. We're going to take a quick look at some of the applications and get some more practice uh, in lab and class. Okay, kind of a ridiculous scenario, but one that might illustrate a point we have some familiarity with. Uh, two identical twins. So each identical twin then um, would have the same mass. So they have both the same m. One of the twins is going to jump into a big pool of water. We've all done that. The other not-so-fortunate twin is going to jump from the same height onto a concrete block. And again, we might imagine who's worse off, who's better off, but we want to use impulse momentum theorem uh, to talk a little bit about um, how this would happen. So let's watch our water diver first. We can imagine he falls, hits the surface, and then slowly comes to a stop down there, right? Our concrete diver falls and hits the surface at the same speed the other guy hit the water, but man, he stops fast. Maybe look like this, like that. So let's take a look when all is said and done, what's the same and what's different? So it may seem strange to believe, but they actually both have the same change in momentum, the same delta P in that case. Um, what happened though was the duration of time that that change took place. If you hit the water, it takes a while for you to stop, so that's a big duration of time. If you hit concrete, that's a really small duration of time. So in order for them to have the same momentum, a huge force had to be exerted on the concrete jumping kid in a very short time. That force means, ouch, that's dangerous. And in the water, a smaller force over a longer period of time could give you the same change in momentum. So we can see we can use the impulse momentum for uh, safety and engineering um, purposes to bring us to stops quickly, and we'll take a look at those. So here's a couple examples of where we'd use the impulse momentum theorem maybe to safely stop an object. That means take it from a high momentum to zero momentum. Um, cars have these regions that are designed to crush in the front and in the rear of the car called a crumple zone. Uh, the airbag is also there to help us out when that goes on. So if we think about that, what that happens is we can stop a number of different ways, but they all mean that we're going to change our momentum. And when we have a crumple zone and an airbag, it lengthens the time that that change in momentum takes place. And that means that we can change momentum with a much lower force on the occupant. So that small f we're reading, hey, that's stopping safely. Um, maybe a more, pra not a practical example, but something you have experience with. If you're going to catch a water balloon or an egg, you catch that differently than a baseball, right? Because you know if the force is too high on the water balloon or the egg, it'll break or it'll burst. So typically we, we cradle it or we cushion the blow by, by catching it and moving our hands downward. You can imagine as these people are going to catch the water balloon here, they're going to sort of have a little bit of give or cushion in there. And again, that does the same thing. That increases the time that you're changing the balloon or the egg's momentum and lowers the force. So we can also use the impulse and momentum theorem also kind of in reverse. If our goal is to get something moving very fast or to travel a long distance, we've got to think about starting at zero momentum and then giving it a lot of momentum, which we mean giving a mass a high velocity. So one of the ways that we can do this with a gun is to make uh, the barrel of the gun really, really long. So guns that are designed to shoot things really great distances, they have to have that projectile moving really, really fast. So what we're talking about is changing the momentum of the bullet or the shell. And there's a couple ways that we can do that. You could put more powder in there so the exploding and the expanded gases are pushing it out with a lot of force. But you can also increase the length of that barrel. And so that force is applied or pushing the bullet out 
for a long period of time. So that would give us a very large change of momentum, get something moving really fast. It's also applicable right in sports. You know, how many times have you been told in whatever sport to follow through? When you follow through with a swing or a kick or a throw, whatever it is, you're increasing the time that you're actually pushing uh, the ball or whatever the object is forward. So you're able to change its momentum a greater amount. So again, to summarize, if our goal is to give something a lot of velocity, that means to change its momentum a lot, get a big delta P from uh, zero to some high final velocity, then there's two things we want to do. We want to be really strong. We want to push hard. And we also want to make sure that we're pushing for a long period of time. So without doing any math yet at this point, let's just see if we can use the impulse momentum question, or theorem to answer some of these questions, and we'll discuss these uh, after the lecture. Using the impulse momentum theorem, explain why it hurts less to fall on grass than concrete. If two freestyle swimmers have the same strength, why does the taller swimmer usually have an advantage? And three, frogs are known as good jumpers. Can you think of a physical reason for this? We'll discuss these answers as we move on before we do our lab.